Thank you so much, Rob, and thank you so much, um, you, Kirk, not least the wonderful Amber, who has been really pulling all of these uh, new outreach opportunities together. So I really commend you, Kirk, for, for all the work that it's doing. Um, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about recosting energy, but actually this was a very much a sort of co-creation with many support from you, Kirk, members. So um, Professor Catherine Mitchell, Jeff, of course, who we have um, collaborated before in the past, Nigel Cornwall and Thomas Powell. So thank you to all of you as the whole community. Um, I thought I would start with actually outlining what this new energy system might look like. And in many ways, this sort of shapes how we've um, sort of developed recosting energy. Um, now, today, we've probably got 400 key players in the energy sector. Um, everybody knows each other's um, golf handicaps and their, uh, their first names. Um, we're going to be moving to a system that's going to have 100 million actions and assets. This is a massive change. I mean, a total transformation. If you think every EV car can move, can, can do two actions. And if I may, and I hope, um, you know, this isn't too much of a, 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 a negative point, but um, in the middle here is potentially off-gem sitting here trying to manage all these different interrelationships. Um, I also have a fridge here, which might look a bit unusual, but actually it's a really key point that I'd like to make. And that is in the food system, without fridges, supermarkets would have to be three times the size they are today. Consider that in energy. If we don't have demand side actions, if we don't have demand side storage and optimization, our energy system will have to be three times bigger than potentially it should become. Recosting energy was very much focused around um, these, in some ways, trying to break the pillars down, the three key pillars that exist uh, the cost base which is moving from a commodity value to actually a capital asset. Um, what you do with that commodity, which is actually the exciting stuff where you add value, and that's around you know, time, location, optimization, and flexibility. And the consumer models, just consider these consumer models as they go forward. They're not going to be around commodities. They're really going to be around assets. So my EV car, my PV, my heat pump. These are things that I'm not going to be able to. I do not have 15, 20,000 pounds sitting in the bank. So I, there are going to have to be new ways of unlocking these assets that are crucial to decarbonization. Um, and as you'll see, everything with a pink box is actually a consumer action. Consumers never played in the generation game before, but now are and are crucial to flexibility and optimization. And again, this is really sort of framing how we looked at the overall system, that net zero is not a consumption model, it's an optimization model, which makes it quite a, a different system to manage. We must look at whole systems costings to ensure that consumers are getting the best value were absolutely key in our report that demand and supply are equal. They're not necessarily equal in scale, but they are equal in value. And that we needed to move from commodities to services. But let's look at exactly where we think the consumer is going to have to play their role. We are expecting the consumer to invest in decarbonized um, transport. We're expecting the citizen to invest in new heating systems and energy efficiency. There are going to be new requirements due to climate change, such as cooling. And we've got real issue here around the inequality between the new losers and the new winners. And please, let's not forget, we have got to get this right at the consumer end. We've got to get the retail side right because the customer, the citizen has a veto on net zero. And today we're captured by some very, very old fashioned ideas that switching is the panacea to everything. Um, that there is very little value that flows to um, the consumer. We've got vanilla products with very little diversity and the incentives are all around consumption, not um, around optimization. And my poor little boy here, 
not mine, but some boy, um, one size most certainly doesn't fit all. So we need to change the system. So recosting energy has looked at it in many ways from um, in many, to, it has really sort of framed the consumer experience in, over, uh, in four key categories. Number one, we've got to reward customers properly for their actions. That requires whole system costing. We need to support those actions and assets as equal to those that are um, generation assets. We must enable new business models to come through. We cannot go on with this one size fits all vanilla product because that's not how energy is going to be consumed. And we've got to unlock choice and tailoring. This is a key part of our report. And while it doesn't seem very consumer friendly, it is absolutely trying to indicate what whole system costings can actually deliver to consumers or what consumers can deliver to the whole system. And I will, this is very, very detailed in our report, but just to give you a little bit more clarity here, um, on the right top side, it shows that if you properly cost the system, not the levelized cost of electricity, you start to see some real benefits in terms of EV cars, in terms of heat pumps, in terms of DSR and energy efficiency. These actually deliver an avoided cost to the whole system, but we are not focusing on them. In our report, we did um, some analysis on, on case studies and an EV van, for example, was going to deliver 500 pounds of value every year to the energy system. It is not rewarded today and must be if we're to unlock these capital assets and to reward customers for their actions and assets. And this is just a little indication of where we are today. This is the money, the resources, and talking to Will from Bayes, right? These are the resources that are put into supply assets. And these on, on the right-hand side are what goes to demand. And these are markets that are regulated who should be unlocking demand in a much more comprehensive way. So I come back to my, my very first question, how do we power up customers? How do we get tens of millions of assets and actions into consumers and small businesses and large businesses too? And the treasury highlighted that it was the investment in the capital that was the key issue. Our recommendations look for a capacity for the capacity market to start to um, be accessed by all assets. Mini contracts for difference with counterparties. Um, energy efficiency being given its full value, the avoided cost of the whole system, um, and that all markets need to be opened to um, uh, to flexibility and and consumer assets. But it. Even that won't do it enough. We need a service economy rather than a commodity economy. And why we think this is because in some ways, how do we unlock these decarbonized products and assets in people's homes? Um, it's only through long-term contracts that we're going to be able to do this. Um, the service provider can in many ways take on the complexity of managing the energy system. It can unlock the value to customers. And very importantly, where the commodity does not incentivize the right behaviors, services actually incentivizes your service provider to deliver you more from less. And if we're trying to reduce consumption, this key component of a service provider is absolutely crucial. And nothing we propose in recosting energy is, um, is new in other markets. It's just it's inhibited in the energy sector. So very last point is this is how it would work. I would be Nissan car leasing company. I would give you a car plus 300 miles per week. I would, as Nissan, be able to go to the, the capacity market, get a micro payment. I would then sell a flexibility purchase agreement to the ESO, to the DNO, um, and then trade the DSR. But as I am embedding those miles into that car as part of your service agreement, I am incentivized to get the lowest cost um, of the commodity. So I, the company, not the consumer, is expected to do all the heavy lifting 
in relation to optimizing the system. And this delivers everyone whole system benefits. So we hope very much that some of these aspects will be taken up by Bayes and Ofgem, and we're doing a lot of outreach um, and with the sector. And I very, very much look forward to everyone's comments, critiques, push forwards, push backs, or just dump it, Laura. <laughs> I'm sure it won't be just, I'm sure it won't be the latter. Um, so at the moment, our panelists appear to be playing musical chairs because I think we've lost Will Blythe and we've regained Sarah K. Bright. But I think, Sarah, can you let us know whether you can hear us, first of all? I think you've come in on a mobile phone. You're muted at the moment. I, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, you. <laughs> I lost so, Wi-Fi completely, sorry. Okay, okay. And we're trying to work out where Will Blythe has, uh, has obviously also disappeared into the ether. Um, uh, oh, we can see you as well, uh, Sarah. Um, so- so I was I was actually going to go to to Sarah first. Um, do you feel are you do you feel prepared for that, Sarah? Given the fact that we lost you for a yes, bit, that's, is that all that's, right? That's fine. Yeah. Okay, please okay. give us your uh, responses and your own perspective. Okay, thank you. All right. So um, at Energy Systems Catapult, we've been uh, engaging with Laura uh, throughout her project, and in parallel, we've been doing our own um, thought leadership. And our thinking certainly aligns with Laura's in many areas. Uh, the Energy Systems Catapult is an innovation agency, and we work directly with innovators and consumers. We have invested heavily in a living lab that innovators can use to test out the business propositions with consumers. And through our consumer trials, we know there is strong potential for energy services. And we also know that innovators are really struggling in today's market. So just like Laura, we would like to see the market coming up with solutions to address the fact that many households don't have the upfront capital available for these new assets, just like we see in other markets like telecoms. So government subsidizing all these new assets is not sustainable nor desirable. And at the Catapult, we don't underestimate the extent to which consumers might want to engage or not. And like Laura, we think business is much better placed compared to the government in delivering the products and services that consumers might actually need and want and in managing risk on behalf of consumers. And we also know that a multitude of different consumer segments exist and various business models are already emerging, but much more business model innovation and engagement are likely if the conditions are right. So Laura's work on the whole electricity system cost metrics by applying it to the demand side is an invaluable contribution to addressing missing value. And when we applied the methodology back in 2018 to various generation options, it revealed to us just how unlevel the playing field can be due to, for example, implicit risk transfers, incoherent policies, socialization of costs mm -hmm. that affect the technologies and market actors differently. And it is crucial, therefore, to consider how to efficiently address these issues before designing further policy interventions. For example, by improving market design and incorporating all marginal costs and externalities into energy prices as much as possible. Now for demand response to become a resource that is used daily rather than occasionally, and for flexible resources in general to become economically viable, energy prices need to be much more granular, free of distortions and accurately reflect the locational value and scarcity of the system. Energy vector switching is also becoming increasingly necessary, but not likely to happen until we levelize the effective carbon price right across energy vectors and sectors. And this is urgent, particularly for closing the price differential between residential electricity and gas. And Laura rightly flags the lack of a level playing field when it comes to power sector policy. CFDs in a capacity market are not technology neutral. And at the Catapult, we're concerned that these heavy handed interventions will drive a suboptimal power mix with consequent poor outcomes for consumers. So at the moment, what is happening, the government pushes the market by deciding way too many inputs, pretty much deciding the capacity mix. And the out of market actions of the system operator are also growing much more than they need to. So we think the scale up of zero carbon investment requires an outcome based policy that can pull the entire market in a way that is genuinely technology neutral and doesn't distort market signals and creates the space for business model innovation. Now, Laura's previous work on regulatory innovation makes a really strong case for outcome based policy. In our recent report on electricity market design, we call for replacement of CFDs in the capacity market with an alternative policy framework that is more compatible with the demand side and distributed energy resources. And this involves shifting the policy drivers to decarbonization and reliability downstream into the electricity retail market. 
a decarbonisation obligation linked to the Climate Change Committee's carbon budget and its recommendation for the power sector to fully decarbonise by 2035 could be applied to retailers' resource portfolios. And in addition, a reliability requirement on the retailers could strongly motivate retailers to use demand-side resources within their own resource portfolios. An outcome-based approach should be applied right across the energy sector, with, for example, sectoral carbon intensity standards complementing carbon pricing, incentivizing the actors that actually drive markets. And so, for example, as part of a policy package, carbon performance standards could be applied to buildings with asset owners obligated to achieve the standard at some point in the future. And this would be a really strong driver to optimize supply and demand. It's obvious that if we expect a lot more from the retail market, then a robust consumer protection framework is really necessary. And this should include much higher quality market monitoring, meaningful metrics that make better use of data with continuous feedback for policy development. It should also incorporate regulatory intervention or safeguards in relation to market concentration, abuse of market power, and when the market fails to deliver. And it should also offer protection in relation to market fraud, credit worthiness, cyber security, data privacy, and it should also set minimum standards for services and products for consumers. So it's also necessary to test the products and services and consumer response in trials. Finally, what about vulnerable consumers? Unengaged consumers are split 50-50 across the upper and lower social grades. However, we're seeing evidence that low, uh, low income and vulnerable consumers will want to be active participants in the market. And it's the case that support policy for low carbon, uh, sorry, low income and vulnerable consumers will be needed. And we emphasize that this should involve service solutions designed and tailored for them. And my final point is that a consumer focus should be integral to market and policy design right from the start. And for this to happen, energy sector governance reforms are urgently needed. And that's that's it from me. Okay, super. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I think, so we're still struggling to contact uh, Will. Uh, he is, uh, I'm in a little bit in contact with him by text. Uh, and he may be able to rejoin us by via his mobile phone. We are, we obviously have been cursed uh, by the network by the by the data carrying rather than an electron carrying network uh, today. Uh, so Jeff, I'll pass on to you. And if we can't um, if we can't reconnect well in time, I'll just give a few thoughts of my own uh, about some of uh, some of some of the things that have been said, uh, Jeff. Lovely. Thank you, Rob. Um, and it's it's always wonderful to share a platform with Laura um, after we've shared quite a few reports together now. Um, I was wondering also, maybe Laura could do something next about sorting out telecoms networks, given clearly um, there's some issues to be resolved there. Um, so I, I was going to just say, I think, three brief things. So firstly, I'm here representing the Energy Revolution Research Consortium. So that's a consortium of 60 or so researchers, and it's part of the government's industrial strategy challenge fund prospering from the energy revolution. So that's that 100 million pounds or so um, bunch of program to basically demonstrate what a smart local energy system of the future looks like today in real places, real people, real customers, real citizens, real technologies, all of that stuff. Um, and I've got the privilege of looking after the governance aspect of that which is squarely in this territory. And really what the challenges there are, how do you allow these new smart local energy systems, um, delivering heat, mobility, electricity, all of that stuff to people in real places, how do you let them do their things in what is a very prescriptive and to some extent constraining set of governance and rules at the moment? And that's what we're looking at. We haven't figured out the answer yet, but. Um, Inputs like Laura's are really, really helpful in this space, as our work of you, Kirk, and others. Um, the second point I was going to make, and I saw that Nikki Dean was on the, on the call, so I'm going to give a, a shout out to Nature Energy. We just, um, we've just published um, a paper and a policy briefing, um, which is very relevant here. And it's all about um, which customers might go for the sorts of business models that Laura is looking at here, these future energy business models, much more service orientated and so forth. And what we found is there's actually a reasonable appetite for customers, consumers, if you like, um, to go for these new models. 
but actually quite a lot of the market might not be able to access them. And the reasons being, um, it could be um, what Laura was talking about, like not being able to get, afford to be able to get into it, to buy the technologies to participate in some of these new interesting energy propositions. It might be tenure. You know, if you don't own your own property, you don't have the right to go and install some of this kit. Um, it's up to your landlord. This is particularly true of the private rented sector. And also it might be because people are incredibly disengaged with energy. So they won't participate because they don't want to. Um, and what happens um, if a lot of those groups are left behind in this transition? This is a real material worry, I think. Um, and it really starts to cast some light on where some of the policy priorities should be about firstly enabling some of these models, secondly, helping some of these groups who would not otherwise benefit from this transition um, by allowing them to participate in different ways um, and to get those groups involved and maybe even to help some of those groups, groups realize the benefits before they would do usually. So perhaps those in fuel poverty or those in particularly difficult circumstances, they could be helped first, soonest and most targeted. And then the final point I wanted to make is, in some ways, the future is already here. So I'm lucky enough in my house to have solar panels on my roof, a battery down in my cellar. Um, and actually, I'm no longer so um, interested in the commodity and like purchasing um, uh, kind of units of energy. What I'm actually used to do now is consuming energy when it suits the system. And the weird thing about the last couple of years, um, because I've been on some very agile tariffs, um, is actually my electricity consumption has gone up, but I'm paying less as a consequence. And that's because I'm consuming it at the right time for the system. Um, and frankly, if someone offered to automate most of that service, um, I'd be quite happy if I trusted them to just get on and do it um, and provide that service for me. So I think the future's almost already here, but I'm one of the lucky ones. I want those other ones, uh, many other people to be able to experience this first. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm hoping Will's come back so he can say something. No, Will's not back. Uh, and uh, Will's landline is, has also, is also down. So I suspect it's a network uh, problem and uh, we're trying to see whether we can get him back in via his mobile. Um, in the meantime, I'll make a couple of observations uh, that, are, that are along the lines that I think that Will uh, would have made because we're, we're working together on some aspects of this uh, uh, from, uh, from you, Kirk. And I think what we would, uh, what we would say is that we're broad, uh, I have a, perhaps this is more of a personal perspective, a, a broad agreement with much of what's said uh, in, in Laura's report and some of what Sarah was saying uh, from the consumer perspective and from the provision of flexibility and what I would characterize as the downstream end of the electricity market. I think where I'd part, part company in particular from some of the things that Sarah was saying uh, is moving more towards the upstream end uh, and think and particularly thinking about very large uh, infrastructure assets like offshore wind farms, uh, which I don't think we can treat as if they were as if all were equal uh, and uh, have a different kind of requirements in terms of um, counterparties for, uh, for, a, for, for an investment uh, and uh, sort of a certain degree of de-risking that's rather different from some of the more agile and different again from the network assets. And so therefore, I think we need in the, in the context of trying to affect very rapid change in the energy system, I think that we we, we need to proceed in the way that Sarah that uh, Laura describes actually in in her slides. We're proceeding uh, in a kind of stepwise function from where we are now, thinking about how we open up, change, and modify the CFDs and uh, and the capacity market, rather than at least in the short term uh, scrapping them all together and replacing them with something quite different that looks to me like a return to the renewables obligation of the early two thousands. But this is something which we need to test empirically and this is something that we need to understand better this is something that we need to explore in particular in my view with investors at different points in the kind of in the spectrum if you like from upstream to downstream and from asset heavy to asset light um, and understand you know the different kind of uh, motivating factors and 
requirements. And so I very much welcome the kind of consumer centric end of things. And I think thinking about moving from assets to services and thinking about the kind of provision of flexibility is something that we have um, has been going running around in the energy community for some time. And that provides me with a bit of a segue actually into some of our Q&A. So I think what I'll do is I'll move to Q&A. We're still via various uh, means communicating independently with Will and hoping that we can bring him back, uh, back into the uh, conversation. But I mentioned uh, the, the service based models and uh, we have a question uh, on service based models from Michael Fell. Uh, which says the move towards service-based models um, has been, to paraphrase, hoped for, uh, aspired to for a very long time. Uh, so what's going to change now to allow that to actually take off? Um, and um, there's, there's some, some various kind of reasons for why that might be might be difficult, like, um, you know, contractual length and, and, and so on. So, you know, uh, energy, service, energy service models, super terrific. We've been talking about it for 20 years. What's new? Um, I'll start with Laura, and I'll also put that to Jeff. <laughs> thank you, Rob. And um, thank everybody else for their great comments and um, inputs. Um, yeah, I mean, personally, I mean, th there are some service models out there. Um, there are some really interesting service models which actually addresses Jeff's issues about low-income families, um, where they're actually turning you know, social blocks of flats into virtual, I mean, not into virtual, but into little mini power stations where they're really driving through that energy efficiency issue. Yes, so they exist. They have to do backflips and forward rolls to get around the regulation to enable them to actually build service models. So the friction in building those models is very expensive, which means therefore that it can only be rolled out to either train spotters like all of us um, or to people with lots of money. So you've got to ensure that there is a level playing field from those who are selling a commodity to those who are selling a longer term service. The second challenge that Michael absolutely rightly highlights is this issue about consumer protection. And there is no question that, that, that this is a more, well, on one level, it's a more complex environment for Ofgem to look at the consumer protection area. But secondly, it exists in other markets. So whether that be car leasing, you know, that's a long-term contract, mortgages, that's a long-term contract. All of these have consumer protection that's well-tested. The issue that we have now is actually a lot of consumer protection problems in the commodity market. So it's not that we're swapping the perfection, the, I, the idyllic world of buying a kilowatt hour for something much worse, but we, are, we do have to recognize that there are different vulnerabilities. I would though very much picking up on Jeff's point about low income homes and in a weird world of my life when I was a member of parliament, I represented a, um, a constituency where the average wage was 16 and a half thousand pounds a year, average wage. Now, all I would say to you, the toxicity of the energy bill was not really actually the amount, although it could be, but it wasn't that that was really problematic. It was that nobody knew what was in the envelope or in the email. The unpredictability, the um, volatility and the ability for low income families to have a predictable environment in which they can operate. And the risk then sits with the company, not with the consumer, because they've given you a fixed cost. And this happened in mobile phones. This has happened in all sorts of different areas. I would just like the energy sector to come up, you know, move with the times. Good. Okay. Interesting stuff. I'm going to bring Jeff in on the same question and then uh, Will Blythe has reappeared. So I'm going to ask him to make some observations and then I'll go back to Q&A. But uh, Jeff. Yeah. So I'll just add a couple of couple of quick things. Um, and hi, Mike, how are you doing? Um, so the, so I think there's, there's a couple of things. So one of the, the big ticket um, aspects um, that you sort of allude to in your question is that whilst 
things like service-based models are just about okay under current regulations, it doesn't mean they're easy and it doesn't mean they end up giving the same proposition to, the, to their customers that they actually intended to when they first went into it um, with a nice blank sheet of paper and all of that. The, the, the rules, the regulations, the billing, everything that kind of like comes through, like let's say a supplier license, uh, means that they end up not being the perfect model of what they wanted to be in the first place, but something that's a little bit um, between what a traditional supplier is and what they want it to be. So it's um, that they're, they're forced down a certain pathway because of the regulations at the moment. The second aspect that you're alluding to is things like long term contracts. Now, I'm with Laura that actually a lot of these things are sorted out in other sectors. You know, most people, um, if they want to get an expensive mobile phone, will get some sort of finance package with that and then have a service contract on the side of it. You know, that's very sorted and if you if you want to fire your service provider that's fine you still need to pay back your finance um, to someone um, that could be the same in energy with some of these long-term propositions however the key thing that needs to be in there is interoperability of the kit that is put into people's homes so let's just say you've got a really smart home if that interoperability isn't there and your service provider is being quite naughty you can't fire them because your kit doesn't work with anyone else. And that's a really crucial thing we need to sort out in energy. It's not just the kit and the interoperability, but it's also the portability of your data um, so that you can go and get the same level of service from another service provider without having someone else lock your data away and everyone have to start from scratch. So there's quite a few issues to sort out in here. And I say that as a person who used to work at Ofgem as well. So, um, you know, the, the, they know, uh, the regulator knows, um, but it's tough to unpick all of this. Yeah, okay. I mean, very long-standing uh, uh, kind of conflicts uh, between the desire, the understandable desire in an industry that didn't used to have any choice to try and affect choice and therefore a preoccupation with switching and therefore a kind of uh, a, a dislike of contractual uh, norms that are quite common in other sectors. And that's actually, in some respects, been a bit of an impediment. But, but nevertheless, uh, interesting stuff. And Will, you know, I can see Will, and I'm hoping that Will is uh, able to go. You're on mute at the moment, Will, but can you hear us? Can you have a go at speaking? I can hear you, and hopefully this works. Sorry about that. Um, and I'm okay. really disappointed to have missed the, the discussion up till now. Although I did have the, uh, I did watch Laura um, presenting uh last week uh, so I'm a little bit familiar with your um you know views in the report and so on so it's really fascinating um but jumping slightly out of context because i haven't heard the q a so far um also jumping in a little bit as a fish out of water because my home turf i suppose is wholesale markets rather than retail um but obviously those two things have to match up at some point and connect um because at the end of the day it's all electricity it's got to be generated and 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 consumed so those two markets um obviously connect and the sort of most obvious way to make them connect is is by having you know through the for the through the energy market and the sort of purest view is to have an energy only market where everybody sees you know the the variable price at the time it's generated at the time it's consumed in the place uh, where it's consumed to sort of make it real time real location and so on and as for some um retail and for some wholesale sort of players that's that might be the right thing to do because you know you're creating the signals that people need to be able to respond flexibly and i'm sure you've talked about this in in your remarks laura um about the role of you know consumers becoming um producers as well and and being much more active participants um i think the the, the other end of the that spectrum of the generation is is where I sort of think about things in terms of the large scale generation. And for me, you know, the question then is, does everybody need to be exposed to those uh, sort of real time, real space uh, prices? Is that the most efficient way um, to do things? And um, I'm, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate your uh, 
thought the remarks you made previously in in, in the the uh, presentation I did see when you were saying you, you're looking for disruption. I think in the wholesale end of things, things are being massively disrupted. Um, you know, already as as a result of the low carbon transition. And I just sort of in my head, there's a there's a great diagram that I think Carbon Trust came up with, which is looking at the sources of cost reduction or, or the drivers of cost reduction in offshore wind. Um, a case study from a, a couple of years ago, or maybe last year, um, where most of the um, reduction was due to demand pull mechanisms. Um, a lot of that was R&D, private R&D driven by you know expectations of market growth. And, and but a lot of it was learning by doing economies of scale and financing costs. And so I think there's a sense in the transition in my head around economies of scale where you, you've just got to kind of create uh, a big enough market for some of this stuff that you, you that, that drives down costs. And for the large scale end of things, I think the uh, mechanisms that have been put in place for, for de-risking have been extremely important part of that. So um, I won't go on for too long because I think some of this may be out of context and I don't want to sort of drive things in a direction they weren't going. So I'll, I'll stop there, but happy to kind of join the Q&A uh, as we go forward. Thanks. No, that's great. That's very helpful, Will. Uh, and it echoes, I, I made a few observations uh, along those lines as I was anticipating that would be some of the things that you'd be saying. Now I'm trying to take these in the order of, 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 of voting popularity and there's two that are equal. So I'm going to go to the one that was that was typed uh, slightly earlier than the, the than the other, and that's from Peter Allen. And uh, Laura, that was brilliant, and so and, and so on, as indeed it was. Um, and the question is, what you see as the main drivers? So I'm going to put this to the other panelists as well. Actually, main drivers for energy efficiency. So suppliers, the network. Um, other innovators or is this the government? I mean, I think I'd say regulation actually more specifically. There might be a difference between demand response and energy efficiency as well uh, in this regard, but the question says energy efficiency. So let's go with that. So, so I would say firstly that we've got to reward energy efficiency of its full value. So unlike demand side response, which is a sort of, uh, you know, a, a time located action, Energy efficiency reduces the whole system costs permanently if it's, let's say, insulation. So it has a much, much bigger value and really must be able to um, access the capacity market because it in increases capacity um, and must be allowed to receive the right level of support to actually implement it. Who then implements it is very, very important, but fundamentally, I mean, I can see that it's actually not going to be the suppliers. The ecosystem hasn't been a total success, although some people would say it was. Um, the networks actually can do street by street, which is a very, very efficient and effective way of doing it. But actually it's going to be service providers. And if what you try and do is tell somebody or tell me that I'm going to lose half an inch of right away, it, throughout my house I tell you what you're going to have to give me a really lovely PV package with an EV with this with that to incentivize me to take those actions so we need particularly in energy efficiency some really innovative models but there is a great company which um, I've just only recently come across called Ciro Homes which is doing the social housing um, integrated energy efficiency plus power generation. And that's what we really need is not energy efficiency. We need energy efficiency plus generation plus mobility. And to package that up, that will start to reduce prices for consumers because actually they've got multiple revenue streams. But firstly, we've got to reward customers for what they can deliver and energy efficiency should have a premium reward. All right. So I'm, I'm going to try bringing uh, everyone in on this one. So I think I'll I think I'll go to Sarah next, since I brought Jeff in just now. Okay. Um, yes, I I, um, I I agree with what Laura has just said. Um, the the drivers 
aren't really there right now and they need drivers there are a lot of a lot of barriers to energy efficiency that are well known and that need to be overcome but but what i mentioned um, when i when i spoke was mm -hmm. the idea of a carbon performance standard which would be applied to buildings and the owners of the buildings of the assets would be responsible now it's not to say they become the project manager for integrating the the various options including you know a, a retrofit plus uh, decarbonizing heat and all this stuff as as laura has said and i've repeated you know there's a whole bunch of things that need to come together and businesses is the best place to do that but those incentives those drivers have to be there and the value must be in prices and 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 you know and, and the market signals so all of this has to come together and um, and that is extremely challenging but uh, but it's it's time now we do this at scale rather than sort of pushing stuff in like uh, you know specifying how many heat pumps we want to roll out the opportunity that comes with electrifying heat so energy efficiency is 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 incredible we have to get that right optimizing supply and demand but that means i think putting the right requirement or obligation on the right actor because you know those that own the assets um, are the ones that take the decision and and they their decision they might not want to like laura said you know we i live in a listed building you can see behind me um you know put a, a thick load of uh, solid wall insulation on and so they might they the the, the 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 variety of solutions they will have to make their choices they have you know different preferences depending on on what kind of you know i've talked about consumer segments so but but that driver has to be technology neutral and then the companies would then bring the different technology options together and and present an attractive service proposition to the consumers that would make the choices you know so that's how we envisage it would it would work okay it's a very free market world um so uh i'm gonna go to jeff next so i think most of the most of the good and important points have been taken. I think the only thing I would add on top of that is to consider the role of local and trusted actors and intermediaries in energy efficiency. So we did some work in, in Energy Red, um, led by Mike Bell, who's on this call, um, about post-pandemic economic recovery. And what we were basically saying is, um, for lots of things, but energy efficiency is a great example, um, if you took a more local approach, a local energy systems approach, um, and involved local trusted actors, including local authorities, local organizations, et cetera, it could lead to you being able to do something that works for the local population um, in all of their circumstances, it, and it allows things potentially to come along faster. You know, Obviously, to get to 2050 and net zero, we are going to have to go incredibly fast on all sorts of things, you know, energy efficiency, sorting out heating, electric mobility, or whatever other form of zero carbon mobility, plus, you know, complete decarbonization of electricity. So what we need in this is the approaches that go at the pace commensurate with the challenge ahead of us. And so what we're arguing in there um, is work um, through organizations that have that trust in the first place. Um, and where possible, touch houses once. And I think that's coming back to Laura's point about not just energy efficiency, but energy efficiency plus all the other stuff um, that's going on in there. And then you can use mechanisms that are appropriate for um, people in different circumstances, households in different circumstances, small businesses, for goodness sake, they're always forgotten about in all of this. So, so I think there is that element of who's gonna do it. You know, if we draw an analogy, it's basically, um, how we did test and trace versus how we did vaccine rollout, um, you know, and see which one worked out better in that respect and which one was more locally organized. Could I just come back, Rob, and say something additional? Yes. Um, and that you mentioned free market, uh, but, you know, we're talking about doing things at scale for the mass market, but what Jeff just said, completely agree and we've done a lot of work on local area energy planning but we try to identify locally you know where it makes sense to to do things at scale and that might require different ways of organizing it through local authorities and what have you but still retailers would be the coordinator you know and organizing the supply chain connecting consumers with programs opportunities local authorities you know and and and, and bringing these things together so they would 
you know, the, taking advantage of the various opportunities, you know, the DNOs that also are trying to procure efficiency to reduce demand, to avoid congestion and stuff like that. So, so you know, it's a combination of things, but we, we try to make the most of the market is what I'm trying to say. But I would just like to jump in here just very quickly, and that is the sort of people that, that we currently have supplying energy are not necessarily the sort of people that can do these blended products and services. And actually what we really need to do is to get new competition into the sector to start opening it up to solution providers uh, rather than commodity providers. I mean, there are some, some great suppliers, but fundamentally they're in the commodity business, not in the service. And, and to be frank, sort of product assurance maintenance etc business which has to come with all these um interventions in home okay well you're looking you've unmuted yourself i was going to jump in yeah i think they're all great points and i do think you know for getting the right solution providers is kind of really important it's actually i've never tried to do it but i've talked to people who have tried to kind of get it's really not easy and people it's just not available uh, the only other point i wanted to add in was just kind of the driver for it um i mean as you've pointed out laura it's, it's also quite expensive but the thing is houses are ridiculously expensive now and so the, the proportion i mean that you could say houses are massively overinflated in, in, in as an asset class but they are what they are and maybe they're worth it i mean that's we're, we're living in a sort of very crowded island and and you know land prices are high so the asset that you're sitting on is extremely highly valued and therefore the amount you have to spend more as a proportion of that to get it energy efficient is you know relatively low um if you so the, the therefore my argument that i'm sort of throwing into the mix uh, around the incentives for doing this could be it's a little bit off the wall but the financial organizations who are responsible for lending money into this sector should be also part of the solution i mean half of my house is not mine at all i mean you say i'm i mean i could say i'm the owner so therefore it's my thing to sort it out but actually the, the mortgage company owns half of it now if you were to make finance companies not able to say that there's a you know that they're carbon neutral unless they go and sort out the housing stock uh it may be a bonkers idea, but it um, creates a, a, an important set of very rich, you know, um, yeah. people who, who, who might be willing to kind of intervene. Now, they're not obviously going to be the ones who actually come and uh, put the insulation on the walls, but creates right. a financial driver. So I'm just conscious that we've got quite a lot of questions. We spent a lot of time. It's a really, really interesting one. Um, and uh, certainly access to capital um, is a is is you know, there are a number of barriers to energy efficiency. We we know them well. Non-price market failures, information failures, and a whole bunch of other things come into it. Access to capital, as we've already said, also comes into it. Certainly, there's a role for innovative solutions. Um, I think it's important. You know, boring old regulation does have a role to play. You know, the car that you drive, uh, you might you might have all all sorts of choice around it, but you're not obliged to have a a kind of pollution control obligation and you choose whether you have a catalytic converter or not you don't choose whether or not it has seat belts and you don't choose how the headlights uh, are positioned in the car uh, and for good reason and so i do think we shouldn't overlook the importance of boring old regulation that's been a huge huge driver of energy efficiency improvement so uh, i'm going to go to a slightly what was related question um and I'm going to paraphrase it. It's from an anonymous attendee and it's and ask the question about trust. I think this is a terrifically important question. So I'm just going to ask the first half of this question to, uh, to, to all of you. I think I might start with Jeff, then go to Laura. Who can consumers trust, for goodness sake? I, I think it's a terrific question, anonymous attendee. Um, and it, I think it, if I relate that a little bit to Peter's question, Peter Connor's question, the next one about the Tesla um, offer that came out today. So again, customers are not some uniform blob. You know, they're, they're you know, lots of households have got very different motivations, circumstances, all of that kind of thing. So the, the question about who um, a particular household trusts or a business trusts, um, depends on their circumstances, who they know, their lifestyle they've had, their uh, the experiences they've been through. So it really does matter. So some households might really trust Tesla to come in and do everything for them. 
you know, because they've got that kind of like um, that particular kind of like um, whatever it is, like techno geek framing, you know, and they're kind of like, you know, very trustworthy of that. Others might want their, you know, local authority to do it. You know, some might want um, their bank to do these things, you know, so trust really depends. So it, you know, we know that, um, let's say, for example, customers don't really um, understand quite a lot of the energy system. Um, you know, most people can barely even say which electricity network they're in until the power goes off and then they ring up their supplier and then the supplier tells them they ring the local network company. So there's no reason why customers should trust um, this fairly invisible industry. But what they do trust is kind of like, you know, particular brands who've worked a long time to build up that trust. Now, that doesn't mean all of those brands are going to come um, weighing into the energy sector because it's dead complicated and it's horrible, frankly, um, to do business in unless you're deeply expert. But... Um, you could imagine um, that those businesses that are much more customer centered, that are much more um, used to understanding their customers and valuing their customers and responding to feedback might actually be terrifically well suited um, to coming into homes, particularly, and this is one of Laura's really important points, if these products, these energy products are actually blended with other things. You know, it doesn't have to just be your energy package that's coming into your home. It can also be your communications, your entertainment, your car, your other stuff. You know, it's, um, people are time poor um, and are just, um, in some cases, in certain parts of the market, absolutely dying for goods customer service, um, which they're often quite poorly served by in energy. So if a package came in that blended it all up and said, like, here's a really cracking lifestyle for a fixed price a month, um, that might not be unpopular in this market today particularly if it also comes with all the side benefits like delivering all of that flexibility invisibly pretty much um, in the background. So yeah. I think it really, it's who, who people trust is who people are um, and what experience they've had. Okay, uh, Laura. So I totally agree with Jeff, as always. Um, <laughs> and, but fundamentally, I mean, currently, I mean, first of all, I have a dream and my dream is that energy will become a B2B product, right? That consumers will not even see it or know about it, which Jeff talked about. And if you think what I've got here is data coming through my computer and it is being managed, it has been optimized for local data caches or central data centers or through my computer, right? I have no visibility here. I don't give a damn. I'm not interested in data. I've got quite a nice Apple computer here, however, so everything is coming to me from somebody that I trust. If you ask me to buy a computer, a really lovely computer, expensive one, from BT Openreach, I'd probably say no. But because I'm buying it from Apple and the optimization, what I'm also buying is an algorithm. And that algorithm is managing the data flow in the most optimal way. Who and how is making money off the back of that data commodity? I don't know. I don't care. I want my service. I want my pretty machine. And I want it to work when it turns on. Okay. Trust is not through the current, most of the current um, players. Yeah, I understand that. Sarah, you mentioned your, uh, the kind of place-based stuff that, uh, that the Catapult has done. Um, and that speaks some, somewhat to a trust agenda, doesn't it? And, and it, it might speak actually more to trusting those that you are, are around you or the role of local authorities um it is what i was actually going to talk about was market monitoring but um but you know um yeah uh, uh you know for, for, for any of the actors that um that consumers are interacting with you know this question about trust and their performance is really important and that will apply to local authorities uh you know that uh that are uh, developing programs or initiatives or, or what have you. But I wanted to actually emphasize the role of market monitoring for retail markets and wholesale markets. They are absolutely crucial in relation to strengthening confidence in markets. Um, and, um, and I mentioned uh, in, in my um, spiel um, the importance of testing. So, you know, we do that with our living lab in the catapult. Uh, testing consumer propositions and working with innovators and consumers and so on. And this is this plays a crucial role. But you can't have all the innovation, you know, uh, a, a lot of it's actually going to be happening in the market, right? 
And so what you do need is really good market monitoring that is, is tracking developments and is, is, is we make much better use of the data we're now getting access to. Uh, we develop better metrics that are more meaningful and, and, and then policymakers can use this and they are therefore able to be much more agile. In, in their decision making, they get this continuous feedback, this this sort of you know action learning, and it's continuous and therefore is feeding into the policy development, and they can react and make sure that they're taking the right decisions and and making the right interventions that are well informed, so that the stuff I related I talked about in relation to consumer protection, you know, happens and is developed, and we have a robust market. Uh, we do not want to see some of the downsides that we're, we're worrying about. And we don't want that to prevent the, the opportunity of, of, of consumers being able to get access to their value. Like Laura has emphasized, you know, it could make the real difference between, you know, the, the, the side, the scale of the capacity we need to build if we don't unlock the demand side. But, you know, these issues in relation to trust are just so important. And it is a great question. So, so that market monitor is important. I also think it should be by an independent market monitor. We have this in US markets. It's, in, it's really important because there are a lot of stakeholders, not just consumers, obviously investors, but a, a lot of stakeholders that have an interest in, in and really understanding what is happening in the markets. And that, um, you know, if, because there are so many decision makers like the system operator, like local authorities, the government, Ofgem and so on, they all are responsible for taking different actions. And therefore, that's why it needs to be independent, because those recommendations are flowing from the information, the data, and, um, and, and, and go out to the various parties that are responsible for doing something about any issues that arise. Okay, look, we've, uh, we've run over time. We've run over time already. Uh, and uh, I didn't manage to get through even a, a, a kind of less than half of the questions that we've got in in the chat so i can only apologize to all those that, that asked a question that we didn't have time uh, to get to you there's obviously a huge amount more that we can uh, revisit and so my suggestion is that we use a subsequent uh, uh opportunity for one of our series to do exactly that and to follow up on uh, some of the things that we've seen in the chat, some of the things that have come up now. I'm not convinced that we've nailed it on trust, guys. I don't, still don't trust any of those people. And that still is a, a potential uh, issue. And there's, there's, there's a number of other things that we could come back to as well. In the interest of time, I'm just going to um, uh, thank all my panellists. Uh, I won't try and conclude. That would be almost impossible. Um, I'm not going to ask my panellists for a final comment, although it does tell me to do that on my notes because we're already over time. Uh, we'll post a video of this on our website, www.ukirk.ac.uk. And thank you all again. Thank you for uh, all of the brilliant questions. Um, thanks to Amber, uh, our new um, uh, um, uh, organisation person to, for bringing everybody together. And if you've got any further comments, you can email Amber, actually, amber.soya at ucl.ac.uk, and the recording will pop up on our website soon. Thanks. I think that's it. Thank you all. Bye-bye.